tonight's presentation, they always get me. Um, tonight's presentation, as I said, is being hosted by the Master uh, Yavapai County Master Gardeners. We are part of the Arizona University of Arizona Cooperative Extension. Every county in Arizona has a cooperative extension office. You may be familiar with some of our other programs such as 4-H, food safety, nutrition education, STEM and commercial horticulture and small acreage support. Master Gardeners provide science-based horticulture information. And tonight's presentation is on molds, mildew and fungi. Our presenter tonight is Lauren Paz. Lauren moved to Prescott Valley after retiring in 2014. She became a master gardener in 2019 and has served as the Speakers Bureau Chair oh, for several years now. She's an avid backyard gardener and applying the information gained to all aspects of caring for her yard and that of her community and promoting good stewardship of our environment. I'm really excited to hear this presentation, Lauren. So go ahead, take it away. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, and as uh, Trisha said, we are part of the University of Ex Arizona Extension office. We have offices in Prescott and Verity Valley. And uh, the information below, as far as our Speakers Bureau email, I think has already been posted. Um, so, I found this fascinating as I was researching it because we talk about fungi, we talk about mold, and we talk about mildew. But generally speaking, everything we're talking about tonight is a fungi, which is a spore producing organism feeding on organic matter, which includes molds, yeast, mushrooms, and toadstools. Mold itself it includes all species of microscopic fungi that grow in the multicellular filaments. They're called hyphae and is found on any organic matter which has moisture issues. And I think we've all seen mold in uh, areas that maybe we had a, a leak in our sink or just mold out in our gardens. Mildew, um, which is also a kind of mold or, and fungus, um, that term is used to describe a mold that is a very flat growth and it, it, it grows in areas with very high moisture. So some things that we should all know about fungi, um, they are not plants um, nor animals. They are in their own separate kingdom as far as designation. The part of the fungus that we notice, which is above ground, is the fruit, and it is the reproductive structure of the organism. The living body of the fungus is the mycelium, and that's made of a web of tiny filaments called hyphae, and it's usually in the soil. In a few instances, it's not, and we will have pictures of that in, as we walk through this presentation. The webs of the mycelium are unseen generally until they develop, and they can develop into mushrooms, truffles, and other fruiting bodies. There are one over 100,000 species of fungi that have been identified in their kingdom, but scientists believe that there's at least 1.5 million uh, different varieties of fungi worldwide. So most fungi build their cell walls out of chitin, which is the same thing as how the hard outer shells of insects like beetles. Um, fungi do not have stomachs, but they absorb nutrients from organic materials and have evolved to feed on all sorts of different organic food. And that includes clothing, um, furniture, anything that's of a soft material or uh, that has been made out of an organic product. Some fungi are pathogenic, and that can include things like athlete's foot, valley fever, and ringworm that can occur in both humans and animals. And there is another, there's a whole list of uh, fungi-related uh, diseases. Fungal products are used in everyday products, um, such as yeast, uh, many drugs, and general food products, which include flavorings, vitamins, and enzymes that um, for stain remover. Um, so when people say they're allergic to mushrooms, these are other things that they may need to consider as they're using other forms of fungal products. So 
one interesting thing is, you know, we always say, oh gosh, we have all of, we have mildew in our garden and we have, you know, mushrooms. Well, fungi itself in the garden can be a good thing. The mycorrhizae um, is a beneficial fungi that attaches to the root systems of underground and it breaks down nutrients in the soil so it makes it easier to, for the plants to absorb the nutrients. The mycorrhizae will thrive by adding compost, avoiding chemical fungicides that go into the ground and could kill it off, and not tilling the soil, which can damage the entire network of the hyphae. Um, planting crops in the fall can also help maintain um, the, the um, mycorrhizae um, during the winter months. And they seem to be, there we are. So mushrooms, and these are just a variety of mushrooms, um, not that we all see these in the yard, but they come in all shapes and sizes. Um, mushrooms generally do minimal damage to the soil, but many are poisonous, as we know, to both animals and humans. It is encouraged that you pluck the mushrooms early before the spore, spores disperse to prevent spreading to other areas. Um, you, they, since they grow from underground mycelia, making them permanently um, disappear is, is very difficult. And this is mycelia is a picture um, on the screen here of this underground mesh network. And it's, it's magnified in this. So if you went in the ground, you probably wouldn't see something so significant. So a couple, I'm gonna go through a couple types of mushrooms here and stinkhorns are one of the ones that um, we could see in the Avapai County. It uh, produces a fruiting body covered with a stinky and sticky substance with a very bad odor. It's um, generally found in lawns, flower beds, and or on dead trees. You'll find these active, um, very active during cool, wet periods in the late summer and fall. Um, and again, think about most fungi dry out with hot weather. So during the prime part of our summer, um, when it's up in the 90s, uh, we probably won't see a lot of fungal activity. Um, these are not harmful to plants, but they recommend that you do not eat the uh, stink cord eggs, and those are the spores that they basically shoot out. And simply can control these by picking them as soon as you see them and just disposing them, remembering never to put um, any fungal product into your compost because the compost, compost is very moist, and that would encourage more growth, and it would transfer to whatever garden bed that you would be putting your compost in. Um, bird's nest fungi is really interesting. Um, they start out as a, a bulb, but they expand out when they're ready to spread their um, little eggs. And they look just like miniature bird's nests. Now this is again magnified. They're not this big and they're very small little eggs. Um, they're only quarter inch tall, and they like to grow on decaying matter such as manure. So if you have a lot of compost with manure in your garden beds, you might see these. They are not harmful to, bit, um, to plants, but they can spread quickly because these bird's nest fungi will shoot, will be exploded out when it's, when it's time to disseminate their seeds. These are usually light brown, gray or yellow in color. And again, it looks like a little cup with tiny little dots in it. So the bird nest fungi are saphirites and a group named um, for the resemblance of miniature bird nests. These tiny egg-like capsules are called paradeals, are attached to the nest with a sticky coil um, that is about three feet in length and when, or about four inches actually, and when they are ejected, they can go over three feet distance. And these little cords that are wrapped to this thing can wrap, or is sticky and it can attach to it and wrap around whatever it lands on to hold on. So you, if you have a patio furniture that's of a material nature, you may find this kind of mushroom actually growing on your furniture. They also um, can, 
be forced out by falling water drops, whether you're watering or just rain. The shotgun or artillery fungi, it comes from the same class as the bird nests. And this is uh, the, the clear part almost looks like glass and then has tiny little black dots. And it has a really unique method of dispersal, um, which we'll talk about in a second. These uh, mushrooms um, or fungi are also not harmful to humans or um, pets, and they do not kill garden plants. They just can take over an area and um, make it look like uh, it's, it's totally engaged with fungi. So um, they grow mostly on old horse manure. That clear glass um, is fruiting body with a black shiny peridot on top of the bulb. This fungi will constantly bend to uh, get a clear path to the light source. And it will, whatever that path is, it'll stay in that direction. At night, it might go straight up again, but it'll stay right back to where the sun or the other light source is. And it does that because when the swollen glass bulb, it swells with water until the pressure is five times that. For the light source because it it then has what it believes is a clear path to send out its its little eggs. Um, similar to the bird's nest, um, it also grows on rotting wood and develops small round fruiting eggs. Um, the spear thrower and cannonball, um, and you can see it. I have one picture overlaid on another, but you can see them in sort of in little. Uh, gouges and decaying wood, but then you can see where this one little ball and each one of these little capsules comes up and it will expel it. It can go um, up to five yards um, from its source um, and it almost is to a point not, it, it shoots it up, but can it can also then float. Um, the force of the inversion launches the pyridol and it can travel again, as I said, five yards or more. So we're going to move a little bit to gray mold uh, or mold, and then we'll go into the mildews. So this is a picture of the gray mold that I think many of us have seen on strawberries. Um, it can start out as a dark little brown patch, and then it can consume the entire fruit. And up in the left-hand corner is an infected geranium leaf. And again, that would have started with a very small brown spot. Um, so in the geranium, you really don't see mold as much as you see the decaying leaf. Um, it is one of the more deadly um, garden varieties. It is also known as Botrytis blight. It requires moisture to infect plants. So prolonged periods of wet weather, such as our monsoons, can be very deadly for our infected plants. Um, one of the ways to help control this is not to do any overhead watering um, because it can also spread by the water splashing and then also by wind. Um, if you can suspect that you might have gray mold, you really want to check your new leaves or the inner petals of a new flower because the browning in there would indicate gray, gray mold is present in the plant. And you know, one of the things they say is an ounce of prevention. So deadheading any dying or dead flowers or just your uh, foliage of leaves, et cetera, that might be brown and throwing them away is the best bet to try to control mold. Um, gray mold can infect some infect fruits, some vegetables, flowers, and in and shrubs. So flowers with thick succulent petals, such as begonias, peonies, and geraniums, are the most uh, susceptible. The fruit from trees, um, such as your apple, peaches, um, etc., are all susceptible, including all berries, tomatoes, and beans. And especially after being harvested and moved into the cool storage area, where it could 
propagate mold that already exists on the plant. And again, we talked about checking for the new inner petals um, to indicate any gray mold. We also have white mold present in this area. Um, the upper left is a zinnia stem and those little black, um, which almost look like little bugs, are actually off the fungi and they're about the size of a, a tip of a pencil lead. And they burrow into the stems and they will kill that portion of the plant um, while other portions of the plant um, up above or below can still remain green. And at the bottom here, you see a fully uh, captured uh, end of a tomato that has white mold on it. So white mold causes stem rot, wilt, and death of many common flowers. The hard structures, which we were the black, um, are sclerotia, and they allow the fungus to survive up to five years in plant beds. And once this mold is introduced to the garden, it will the spores will bury um, during the winter months and then come back during the summer. So if you have white gold mold in your garden, you're going to want to sanitize it either with a chemical addition or by watering it and putting a uh, black top on it and, and baking it for up to four months. Infected parts of the stem will turn tan and dry and, and very brittle and the rest of the stem will remain green. So it almost looks like just part of it's dying off, but you it will continue to affect the plant. And eventually it'll turn into a fluffy white fungal growth and can be seen on your stems and leaves when the humidity is extremely high. Uh, plants that are susceptible to white mold include your annual flowering plants of marigolds, uh, nicotinia, salvia, sunflowers, petunias, and zinnias. Your perennial plants are the chrysanthemums, columbine, delphiniums, peonies, and other actually common gar garden weeds. Um, the white mold really does attract to garden weeds, which is since weeds spread rapidly is another way that white mold is spreading. Your garden vegetables that are susceptible to white mold includes beans, carrots, squash, and tomatoes. And if and you know, it's really suggested that there are varieties now um, of, of seeds and plants that are disease resistant to white mold and gray mold. And we suggest that you, um, as an avid grower, look for these type of uh, resistant varieties. Um, slime mold, I think we've all seen this um, in our yards or just in, in park on grasses. I think a lot of people call it dog vomit. Um, it isn't always just white. To the left, you see it's a sort of an orange coralish, um, but it it's, does not harm the plants, except for the fact if it really gets out of control, it can uh, create a, a, an issue with the photosynthesis process and you can start having leaves die off. Um, it does move out of the dirt soil and can move into other surfaces, so it sort of meanders. Um, you'll find it common on decaying logs and fallen leaves, thatch, which is the layer between your grass and your dirt, um, mulch in your strawberry leaves. And I have seen this in my strawberry bushes, and then all of a sudden it disappears. So during cool, wet weather, the spores germinate and they produce the single cell amoeba like spores and they will feed on the microorganisms in the garden until something causes them to join, which then cause, produces this vomit looking type uh, substance. They will survive the winter um, in your soil. And as fast as they come about, they will disappear just as fast during very hot and dry weather. So you, just generally the way to keep mold out of your garden, regardless of what kind it is. Um, you wanna kill existing mold before planting. So if you had mold issues the prior year, you either sterilize the soil by heat or through chemicals. Um, again, by heat, it's gonna take a little longer. Um, so at this time of the year, if you're trying to look three months ahead, 
with the freezing weather, you may not be able to sterilize your soil because of the extreme cold weather we're having. The chemicals will react fairly quickly, but at the same time, many of us are, are reticent about using chemicals in our garden beds. Um, you can also remove the soil in the areas where the mold existed and just bring in brand new soil. Uh, try to plant in sunny, well -drained, sunny areas that are well-drained. Um, don't overcrowd your plants because that's what causes this canopy of moisture underneath where the mold can just uh, start and thrive on. Um, don't overwater, and when you do water, water the soil and not your plants. You want to check your plants often, and you treat before the mold spreads. And you know, if we have lots of issues with different pests, so I'm out in my garden like every, at least every other day, looking in the in the early morning to see what's going on in my yard. You want to definitely remove all your affected leaves, um, plants, and weeds as they will spread spores, as we noted, to the nearby plants. And it's not just the plant that's right next to it. It could be the next garden bed over. And please do not place infected vegetation in your compost pile, as we said, because this will spur on more growth of the mold. So we have powdery mildew, which is a form of mold. Um, here's a picture on the bottom, which is uh, the white powder looking substance. Um, again, powdery mildew doesn't necessarily kill the plant itself, but if it covers it so much and the plant can't uh, create photosynthesis to keep it to, to survive, it will die. And here on the, on the left-hand side, we have a flock stem that you can see the white powdery mildew and then um, the fungal that's growing within the mildew. Um, so it's, just, it's got actually a double whammy there. So powdery mildew is a fungal disease that can affect almost every type of plant, including shrubs and fruit trees. There are more than 70,000 known species of powdery mildew. Uh, it consists of the white whitish gray thin layered uh, powder on your vegetation, almost like you sifted flour on it. It will cause its leaves to turn yellow and die prematurely if it's extremely thick. The tiny round orange to black balls that we saw on the flax stem may form within the white fungal mats, often at the end of the growing season. And then uh, those little balls fall down into the soil and they remain in the soil until the next season. And uh, the powdery mildew can be the most severe in plants in shaded areas or with poor uh, air movement. And so again, having uh, a lot of plants that are uh, planted very close together will not allow the sun to go in and dry out the can. It, it'll be, the sun will uh, not penetrate that canopy to dry out underneath the, um, near their soil surface. Um, it usually will start on the plant's lower leaves. Again, those would be the ones that are uh, not as direct, does not receive as much direct sunlight. And if you don't treat it, it'll uh, spread over the entire plant within days. Um, again, it interrupts the photosynthesis process um, and that will can actually cause the plant to die because it's losing all its leaves at that point. If the plant is stressed with powdery mildew, um, it can still develop fruit, but that fruit may become underdeveloped because it's taking a lot of energy out of the plant. The powdery mildew prefers temperatures in the 50 to 60 degree Fahrenheit, um, but during the warm days, it'll allow the spores to spread. So it develops in the 50 to 65 degrees, but propagates itself in a higher temperature. Unlike like most fungi, it doesn't require water and it can thrive in warm, dry climates. Um, spores on the powdery mildew easily are easily carried by the wind to up to 100 miles away. And once a spore lands on a host, it will quickly germinate to start a new infection. 
So even if uh, you are not interested in controlling it in your own yard, um, you could certainly infect an entire neighborhood if it gets out of control. And the mildew forms a mat of fungal growth on the surface of the plant and its specialized fungal structures penetrate the plant tissue itself to take the nutrients out of the plant, which is why the fruit production on a plant that has powdery mildew in it may not produce what one would expect. So for uh, the, we're spending a little time on this because it's very common in our area, but there are eight organic treatment options. Um, these are not in any particular order of best to worst, but um, a lot of these options are things that we have common products in our kitchen. Potassium bicarbonate um, is one of them. It kills the spores on contact and is, a, is also a preventative treatment because it raises the pH level over 8.3, which is really not ideal for fungal growth. And the solution can be made of three tablespoons of potassium bicarbonate, three tablespoons of vegetable oil, and a half a teaspoon of dish soap. And the factor with the dish soap and or the vegetable oil, it allows the bicarbonate to stick to the leaves. And that's why we're adding that in. It's also been shown uh, uh, studies by uh, several of our universities that milk interacts with the sun to produce free radicals that are toxic to the fungus. And so just you can do it in full solution or you can make a, uh, if you're going to spray like bi-weekly or weekly, 40% milk to 60% water. And you can also use powdered milk with uh, one ounce with 12, two liters of water. Um, Apple cider vinegar also works very well. It's four tablespoons of vinegar with one gallon of water, applying every three days as needed. However, vinegar can cause sunburn on plant leaves. So you want to really test this out on a couple of leaves first um, to make sure that you're not going to kill your plant because of, of scorching all your leaves. Um, neem oil, I think all of us have use that in the past will kill powder, powdery mildew in within 24 hours by disrupting the plant's metabolism. It stops spore production um, and that immediately shuts it down. So that's three tablespoons of oil to one gallon of water and you spray every seven to 14 days, but you wanna make sure to not spray your buds and or flowers with that. Baking soda has a very high pH also um, of nine. And again, just like bicarbonate, it will kill the fungus. Um, mixing one tablespoon of soda, baking soda to a half a teaspoon of liquid soap with one gallon of water and reapply right after a heavy rain. But don't spray during the daylight hours because the baking soda will, can also burn, do a sunburn on the leaves. So they really suggest that you do it at dusk or first thing in the morning before the sun um, is high in the sky. Sulfur also prevents and controls mildew. Um, it can be purchased both as dust or liquid. Um, and, we're, and you're not going to make your own sulfur product. You're going to buy it and you do certainly need to follow the directions on the package. Um, I found this interesting. Garlic oil has a high sulfur content, which is an antifungicide. So six cloves of crushed garlic, one ounce of neem or organic oil, and one ounce of rubbing alcohol. Um, let it set for a couple days. You want to remove the garlic, re-soak it in one cup of water, and then combine both liquids with one gallon of water and spray only on the leaves and not on the flowers or the fruit. The copper fungicides, they are over the counter. Um, they're effective um, to, but um, can be detrimental to plants and soil. So it's not suggested that you use it unless it's an extreme situation. And just in general, fungicides that you would buy over the counter should be used to protect high value plants with a history of disease. It will not cure the disease. So you will continue to be treating and again, fungicides going into the soil can also disrupt your, 
your um, network of root systems and beneficial fungi at the same time. In the plants that are susceptible to powdery mildew, um, and this they can affect over 10,000 plants. Um, your general flowering plants, again, somewhat of the same ones as we talked about before, marigold, nicotinia, salvia, sunflower, petunias, and zinnias. Last year, I had a beautiful bed of zinnias, and it got the white powder mildew, and it killed almost every single one, plus my zucchini plant. So I am now trying to figure out what to do with that particular bed. Um, our perennial plants include chrysanthemum, chrysanthemums, lilacs, roses, peonies, and other common garden weeds. And the vegetables susceptible to powdery mildew are lettuce, parsley, peppers, tomatoes, and zucchinis. And again, uh, if you're able to plant disease-resistant uh, plants that are disease-resistant to the powdery mildew, and um, buying seeds from a reputable seed dealer it will say on the package um, specifically if it's if it's a uh, disease resistant. Um, so your general prevention and treatment from all of what we talked about is first of all follow good sanitation practice. Um, clean your tools when you're gardening um, when you go between one set of plants to another to make sure you're not transferring the disease just on the equipment they're using and definitely dispose quickly of any dead flowers and infected plants. You wanna water the soil and not the plants. Um, the more water on the leaves, and especially if it's a canopy of plants, the more likely that you will get either mold or mildew. You wanna provide good air circulation in your garden by not overcrowding your plants. Again, this will hold your moisture in and not allow adequate sunlight. Um, and follow just best gardening practices. You want to create healthy plants, and that's through fertilization, proper irrigation, and proper pruning. And then <clears throat> pre-treat or sterilize your contaminated soil before planting the next season. Um, we look at chemical controls as our last resort. Um, it impacts more than just the plant. You can apply fungicides during periods of high humidity and cool temperatures as a last resort and always check your labels to determine if it will control gray mold um, and or, or mildew because not all uh, fungicides do the same, perform the same uh, task. Um, I always recommend if you're gonna use fungicides or even your organic processes to test on a few leaves or a few plants before treating every infected plant. And don't spray the vinegar and baking soda during the day as it will cause sunburn to your plant leaves. And that is what I have for now. Can I have any questions? Well, so far we didn't have any pop up in the, in the chat box. Um, did we have any questions from the audience as you're sitting there listening to the presentation? I thought it was excellent. Lauren, good job. Thank you. Well, you know, it's interesting. I I was going to a lot of different uh, university extensions that you know are for agriculture, and the most uh, the most amount of information I found was out of University of Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Maryland, and that somewhat surprised me because it's such a cold country. And I think, you know, like <laughs> Oregon or Washington that is so wet would have had more information. Interesting. I saw David turned his camera on. Did you have a question, David? Uh, yes, I'm interested in the slide that talked about neem oil um, altering the function of the plant. Uh, did, did you mean the host plant or the fungus? The host plant. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, the fungus itself, not the host plant, but the uh, fungus. All right, yeah. so I could put neem oil on, say, um, a silk tassel bush, and if it's not starting to flower, um, it's, the, it's what it does to the silk tassel that interrupts 
how it, the powder no, and it's mildew what, works? It, it's it is uh, I'm sorry. It's the it interrupts the um, fungal plant or okay. not plant, okay. but so that it doesn't cre create the spores.